Welcome to the 2018 playoffs, Shane. We're getting ready to get started on the best five weeks of the year. We already had the bracket breakdown come out, and we have a lot of good matchups that are going to take place. Obviously, the most coveted place to watch playoff football this year is coming in Class 2A, where there is a dynamite schedule, both top and bottom, north, south. Yeah, uh, it's really... It's really loaded. I mean, all the way on down from the north, the top half of the north, my God, and then, uh, you know, the bottom half of the north worked out pretty good from an EPC perspective. And then in the south, you, you have Tuscola, you have St. Teresa, you have Monroe Forsyth, you have Athens, and much uh, You know what? 2A, like you said, I mean, it's just, it, it's good. It's very good. It is. I mean, and then you take a look at Class 1A, and you Looking at Class 1A, I mean, it went exactly how we thought that it would um, with the, as far as the breakdowns are. Obviously, we had the coin flip with Princeville and Ottawa Marquette to determine which direction um, that was going to take as far as one and two seeds so we could determine where Polo and Orangeville were going as far as their round one matchups. Yeah, um, we kind of wondered how that was going to play out. I mean, that was the only thing really deciding the difference in the brackets that we've seen. Um, it could have worked out a little better, I think, based on what we're going to see happen. Um, I think Orangeville would have matched up a little bit better with Princeville than they do a lot of cap, but, you know, that's the way that goes. Yeah, I mean, you got to take the drop in the bucket, and obviously that's the way it plant panned out, so Orangeville's going to have to play Marquette. But we do have one NUIC matchup taking place in the first round, and that's going to be Dakota at Stockton. Obviously, we won't break down the game just yet, but um, it definitely provides us with an intriguing matchup, to say the least. Yeah, it revives an old rivalry, um, one that's really going to hit full swing next year when they start the new conference alignment. And I don't think these teams have faced in the playoffs since about 2004 when Stockton was on the way to the state championship game. So, I mean, it's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while since they've met up. Um, but overall, I mean, you take a look at what 1-8 North has, and it's very glaring. Lena Winslow and Aurora Christian yeah. heading for a quarterfinal breakdown. Yeah, matchup. they're on a – Collision course here, and uh, I don't know that anybody's going to really get in the way. I just really would have loved to see them on the opposite side of the bracket, but you know, you, you do what you can, and that's a game that we'll be looking forward to in three weeks probably. Um, just got to see what happens before them. Yeah, I mean, uh, more so for Lena Winslow than Aurora Christian, but uh, you definitely cannot overlook. Uh, a team in front of you as it is the playoffs. Um, we've stated it many times. you got to be ready to go come playoff time and take it one week at a time. And if you're not ready to go, you're going to find a way to lose. So that's just it. And you don't have to get into the picks quite yet. But looking at the way the bracket falls, if Aurora Christian doesn't make the quarterfinals, if New England doesn't make the quarterfinals, something went terribly wrong. Right. I definitely agree with that. And um, it's... Something that's going to be a lot of fun for sure, to say the least, uh, to see how those things prepare going down the road and then, you know, taking a full swing, look at 1A South with Tuscola, Warrensburg, Latham, and Athens all going in the 2A bracket. That really opens up 1A South for a lot of teams as well. Yeah, it's basically here is who wants it. Um, not a clear favorite. Um, obviously, there's some, there's still some good teams down there, don't get me wrong, but there's not one that you can just pick out of the bracket and say, this is absolutely going to be the team. Right. Like we thought we might have seen a couple weeks ago. Correct. I mean, not to be mean or anything, but it's definitely probably the weakest 1A bracket in the south part that we've seen in quite a long yeah, time. I would agree with that. Uh, I mean, we've come to accept that there's a lot of dominance from the north to the south, but really you take a look at even the last 10 years, the north is 1-6, the south is 1-4 as far as state titles. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like that, though. No, it does not. But we'll get into the matchup breakdowns right now. 
All right, our first matchup is going to be number 16 seed Polo as they enter the playoffs with a 5-4 and four mark, and they are going to Princeville, who is the number one seed with a 9-0 and oh mark. And Shane, we already got a game time on this one as they'll be played on Friday night at 7 p.m. Polo making their 22nd playoff appearance. Their last appearance was in 2016, where they lost in the first round of Dakota, 42-21. While Princeville is making their 21st appearance, last year they made a quarterfinal run where they finally met their demise to force in 42 to nothing, and they come out of the Lincoln Trail Conference, which in years past has been a very tough conference, but this year has definitely been a little bit down. Um, but it's been one of those years where we definitely projected Princeville to be where they were at. Last year we said that being a junior-dominated team, this was a team that we could easily see going 9-0, and and here they are. Yeah, um, their first round matchup last year was in Dakota, and I had the opportunity to cover them. And you know, I, I get a roster, and you're looking at the roster, and it's junior, 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 and it's just like, wow. Okay, so you look at that, it's like this team should go 9 0, and here we are, they're 9 0, playing against a 5 and 4 polo team that's on their way out of the program here, um, as far as 11 man's concerned. Um, still, still, uh, Willing to put up a fight, though. I mean, I know they had a rough go against DPC last night, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. Yeah, I mean, they've definitely done a lot of surprises um, as far as Polo is concerned. I remember at the beginning of the year, I picked them to go 2-7 and seven because I expect them to be down. Um, and then while we're giving out the projections, I said I, I kind of feel bad because I think Polo is going to be better than where I'm projecting him to be at. Yeah, we. I think we both kind of fell into that. I think I might have had him at four and five or five and four. Actually, I think four and five was yeah. where you were. Yep. I mean, right on that cusp, and you know, they. I'm sorry, but yeah, they still were an orange bowl, and here we are. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, and boy, was that a big game! Yeah. I mean, look at the turn of a difference as they both Just come into the playoffs at five and four. Yep. Um, big game there. Big turnaround in momentum for Polo in that game. And, I mean, if all games looking back, you could point at that one. You could point, you know, they had the 6 and up and lost against River Ridge in a game that they probably felt they could have went one there. And that would have even boosted them higher up had they got that. But they're here now, 5-4. and four. Um, Like you said, last year in 11-man football, going to 8-man football next year. But... Polo's always been a football town, so it's a great thing to see yeah. that the Marcos are in the playoffs as they get ready to leave the NUIC after this season. But they got Princeville. Yeah, um, Prince, Princeville's going to be a hard draw for them. Um, you know, Polo knew they were going to be 16. It was just whether they're going to be Princeville or Ottawa and Marquette. Uh, if I'm a Polo fan, I'm glad to have Princeville because I don't want Marquette. But, it, I mean, pick your poison. It is. Um, both teams are very tough. Um, they both return a lot of experience, and with that experience also comes playoff experience. We're not just talking varsity level experience; we're talking playoff or final experience. Right. Sure. Uh, I mean, in Marquette's sake, I mean, you still got guys that are playing off of those semifinal teams back in '15 and '16 that were freshmen and sophomores yeah. playing on those teams that are here this year as yeah. well. So I mean, it it does go a long way, but uh, you know. I mean, hats off to Polo five and four, a good way to uh, end the campaign. Unfortunately, I gotta take Princeville. Yeah, I do. I'm 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 very excited for the Marco football program, Coach Bumstead and his staff getting these guys prepped up and into the playoffs in their last year in the NUIC. But I do like the Princes in this game. Orangeville comes in with a 15 seed and a 5 and 4 record as they get set to take on the number 2 seed Marquette Crusaders, who come in perfect at 9 and 0. Orangeville is making their 13th playoff appearance, making their back to back playoff appearance for uh, just the third time in school history. Or is it the fourth time now? Either way, it's the first. To, no, it's actually. Yeah, it's the fourth time. Anyway, it's the second time since 1995 and 96. Um, boy, who was who was on that team? Jay Doyle and <laughs> Willie Guy, the head coach and assistant coach for the Broncos. Now are both on those teams. Um, last year, uh, Orangeville lost in the first round to Anawan Weathersfield, thirty-one to fourteen. That was a really close game at halftime. 
I remember correctly, it was 12 to 7 at the half, and then the second half is when Anawan Weathersfield opened it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, Marquette, on the other hand, is making their 15th uh, playoff appearance. They're seventh straight right now. Last year, they lost in the first round to Fulton 34 to 16, a game that featured two top 10 ranked opponents in that game. And uh, Fulton walked away with that one before they met the demise the following week. Yeah, that was the premier match in 1A. I mean, as far as the first round goes, uh, weird. I remember we were down there filling up the, the chalkboard bracket, and we circled, you know, in our minds, like, hey, this is this is the game of the week, so to speak. Right, because they um, fell into that same quad with Forrest, and so that was yeah. definitely the quad to watch at that time. Yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, it's come full circle here. You know, Marquette, like you said it a segment ago, I mean, a lot of these kids are coming off those semifinal teams, uh, a lot of playoff experience. And, you know, Orangeville's kind of starting to get that in a way that you're getting some kids back out there that saw some playoff time last year as well. So, I mean, that's that's huge. And, and you know, Orangeville has some sophomore talent that this can only help them. Oh, definitely. I mean, you take a look at what the Broncos have coming up the pipeline, and you're starting to make a program that understands what it takes to not just get to the playoffs, but it's starting to build that, hey, this is what we have to do to get to the playoffs type mentality. And, uh, you know, you take a look at, you know, when Coach Doyle first took over, I mean, his career started off 1-23. So yeah. I mean, he had a lot of struggles at the start of the career, and here he is. I mean, yes, they're five and four once again, second year in a row, just five and four. But this year's Orangeville team is a more complete package than what last year's team was, in my opinion. I would agree with that. And last year we were, we were talking about all their weapons they had. I mean, they had Boston guy. I mean, he was the MVP of the conference. Yes. So um, you know, and they made some switches there from you know, quarterback and backfield and whatever they decided to do, you know, and I felt pretty good about them going with that matchup with Weathersfield because we looked at it, it was going to potentially be, had Dakota beat Princeville, it was going to be a Dakota Orangeville in the second round had they taken care of anyone, but uh, neither team was able to come through. But as far as this year goes, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I would have rather seen Orangeville match up with Princeville, but here you are. Um, I mean, it's really these four teams, you know, it was Polo, Princeville, Orangeville, and Marquette. You could have uh, threw them in a hat and seen where they were going to land here tonight. Oh, yes, definitely. And, I mean, Orangeville definitely got the tougher draw, as you already stated, grabbing Marquette. It will be interesting to see how this game transpires. I think that Marquette's going to have the line advantage for sure. But being a run team, Orangeville likes to face run teams. So it gives them an opportunity as long as they can get healthy and be ready for week or round one of the playoffs. Um, this could potentially be an upset opportunity, but I like the Crusaders in this matchup. Yeah, I go with Ottawa and Marquette as well. Number 10, Dakota gets set to take on number 7, Stockton, in Stockton as Dakota comes in with a 6-3 and three mark. Stockton comes in with that 7-2 and two mark. Um, Dakota is making their 24th appearance. Uh, last year they lost to Princeville in the first round, 27-24 in double overtime. Game that you were at, Shane, that you really uh, enjoyed taking in. Um, Stockton is making their... Conference record 32nd playoff appearance as last year they lost in the second round to Akron 21 to 14. Again, a game that me and you both took in. Yeah. And boy, that was one heck of a ball game there. Yeah, it really was. And then going into that, we didn't really give it much of a chance, I don't even think. And, you know, but anytime those two teams met up, it was a heck of a game. Um, Dvorak made sure that we had it on paper because he carried the ball was 41 times. 41 times. Oh, um, man. So when I go over to this week's game, I'll be sure to pack an extra stat sheet. <laughs> that, but, I mean, in all reality, I mean, that's what you do. When you got a running back like that, you feed him the ball. Yeah, and, I mean, Snyder, Coach <clears throat> Snyder for Stockton has definitely worked the game plan around making sure that Dvorak is healthy and getting the ball a lot uh, to carry his team where they need him to go. Right. 
Um, this this is a little bit of a different territory for Stockton, though I believe. Um, I mean, even though Dakota is not as physical as the big three in the Northwest, they're still going to be a little bit more physical than what Stockton is used to seeing on a week in and week out. Um, they're going to have their hands full. They are, and here's the reason more so than anything is, <laughs> excuse me, but um, Stockton is still a young team. They, they don't have a lot of senior experience. We're on the other side of the ball. Dakota has got a lot of experience. And in games like this, this is where you start seeing that experience prevail. And, you know, you take a look at the size of the lines and everything. Dakota's going to have the size advantage across the board, with the exception of Dvorak at running back. I mean, I would put Dvorak's strength up against anybody in the conference. Yeah, I mean, he's a heck of a runner, but like you said, the important part is the running game is going to be dependent on that line and opening up holes and what holes might have been there against AFC and Warren or even Wes Carroll aren't going to be there this week. Oh, definitely not. I mean, he's going to have a lot of... Um, if he goes off, he will have earned it. Yes, it's going to be a tough goal as far as getting the holes. So this is one of those games where, you know, he's going to have to create his own holes, per yeah. se, to get the yardage that they need because, you know, you take a look at what their offense is going to do, and they don't pass the ball a whole lot. No. And, and, and Coach Snyder knows, yeah, and Coach Snyder knows that he doesn't, and he may have to – go to some passing on that, but at the same time, you know, Dakota is going to give them that opportunity to determine how good of an offense they really are, or if Dvorak is a good running back against lesser competition. Right, we'll find out. And then on the opposite side of the ball, um, get a chance to see what Dakota's game plan is going to be here. I mean, one series, they might come out with the spread. The next, they might run a double lead. I think they're still figuring out what exactly they want to be yet, um, which they could get away with that this week. But moving forward, they need to figure out and stick with a plan. And, uh, you know, Josh Clark, a quarterback, um, he's a junior, and under pressure at times last night against EPC, it was a little frazzled. But, uh, you know, he, Lena Winslow was in his face all night. I mean, he had no protection, so... Um, he made some mistakes, took some sacks, took some sacks, and had some grounding call. But that should improve on. You know, the the one thing about that grounding call though is a good thing to see. You actually started to get rid of the ball. I didn't um, have a problem with it. And if it, I'm, it hurts when you go in those types of situations, you just gotta make sure you find a receiver and right. throw it in their general direction. Just don't go chucking it away. But again, like you said, it's hard when you have that constant pressure well, in your face all the time. After him, all oh yeah, as well. Um, but I like Dakota in this game. I'm gonna take Stockton at home. Forreston comes in with the number six seed and a seven and two record as they get ready to play host to number eleven seed Kirkland Hiawatha who comes in with a six and three mark. Forreston is making their twenty fourth playoff appearance. Last year they lost in the semifinals to Lena Winslow, twelve to eight. As Lena Winslow went on to win state, Hiawatha is making their fourth appearance in school history. Their last appearance came in 2016 when they lost in the first round of Leroy, 40 to 12. And Shane, if you take a look back, you know one of those three losses for Hiawatha was to Aquin back in week one, and here we have Aquin at four and five sitting at home, a team that forced and dismantled. Yeah, yeah. Um, not a lot I can really say about this. I just want to force and win this pretty comfortably. Um, I mean, we can talk about it a little bit because, I mean, Forrest is really starting to do some good things and not a lot of people are talking about them and I'm sure they're fine with that. Well, you know, when you first saw Forrest at the beginning of the year, they were kind of cocky, arrogant, to a fault. Uh, they go into Lena Winslow and they didn't show up in the first half and then they come out 
in the second half of that game, and they actually started to take it to Lena Wenzel, but the deficit was so much already that they didn't have a chance to get back in it. Because after the first quarter, I mean, at, well, it was a, okay, so it wasn't after the first quarter, but it wasn't far into the second quarter when it was already 29 to nothing in favor of Lena Winslow. Then Forreston started to make it a game. And, and, and they only allowed one more score to Forreston to Lena Winslow the remainder of the night. Yeah. Um, then they followed that up the following week with their big win over Dakota, a game that, to be quite honest, we yeah, had picked against. Um, I mean, yeah. even going back to the preseason, I had Dakota picked ahead of Forreston to begin with. But... Uh, you take a look at that matchup, and yeah, they came out, they shocked everybody. And then they followed that up with another tough game against EPC, where they actually laid an egg and came out flatter than flat. Yeah, and realistic. I mean, we were wondering what they are, and, you know, I mean, they are putting games to them now. But something to keep in mind is they haven't played anybody since. Week four. Yeah. Right? Yes. I mean, it's been five weeks since they've had a competitive game. I mean, Amboy, East Dubuque, Galena, West Carroll. I mean, Ackland. Ackland. No offense, but not exactly five games in a row that are going to get you prepared for the class. However, they're doing what they need to do against them. Yes, they are. They're <clears throat> winning the way that they need to win. And let's keep in mind, it's the exact same schedule that they had the year before, and they end up in the semifinals. And now you take a look at how they break down into this uh, playoff format. And with the sixth seed, I mean, their biggest matchup is going to come most likely in the quarterfinals that they meet Marquette. Yeah, that's, that's it. I mean, if Marquette's not there, Forrest is walking to the semifinals again, in my opinion. Yeah, um, because if it's not Marquette, the next best option is probably a Dakota team. And we've seen what happens between those two when they meet up. They they generally take it to the Indians. So, uh, Forrest, I mean, seriously, Forrest has a gift here. However, they just need to uh, take care of it. Yeah, as far as... Hiawatha goes, I mean, Coach Kenaway has done a good job as far as getting the Hawks back into the playoffs. Um, they did what they had to do coming out of the Northeast Athletic Conference. However, like we stated, outside of Ottawa Marquette, the conference just does not have a lot of strength. Right. One of their wins is also a forfeit win against Our Lady of the Sacred Heart, who uh, decided to go into eight-man football last minute right before the season began. Um, so, you know, it's good that they're here, but their trip's not going to last very long. No, I, I like Forrest and uh, should see the subs early in the third. Yeah, I like Forrest in this matchup as well. Number four seed, Lena Winslow, comes in with an 8 1 mark, which we anticipated them getting after their week four, week five loss to EPC. Um, they're getting ready to take on Lewistown, who comes in with the 13th seed in a 5-4 and four mark. Lewistown needing to get a win last night in Week 9 to make the playoffs. They did that in a relatively close game, closer than I thought it would be when I was looking at it projection-wise. Yeah. Um, but they did. They're here, and they get the defending state champs in round one. They're here. They came, they saw, they left. <laughs> um, realistically, uh, this game's all about Liam Wenzel. Um, you know, early in the year, they kind of showed signs of not really playing up to their potential. EPC game comes to mind over and over and over when I think about that. And, uh, you know, I was talking to some of the guys on the sideline last night, and I said, you know, how have things been going? Because, you know, you hear stories, and you, you don't see these teams that week in, week out. Um, it's impossible with just the three of us to do that like that. Um, but they they put uh, a lot of it on their game against Dupac. They said you know that it was you know it was a running clock, but fundamentally sound. They started playing better against Dupac. They followed that up with probably their best game here against Dakota last night, and not you know it's basically what we have anticipated. You get the schedule. You mean you're defending state champs. Every year is different, but it's it's hard. Um, 
you know you're good. Um, you want to get to the playoffs. But, uh, I mean, however, there are some holes on this Lane Wizzle team compared to last year. I mean, the secondary has a few issues, but uh, I don't see that being a problem this week. Well, and that's just it. You know, it's one thing that Coach Aaron always prophesizes on. We need to be playing better football in week nine than we are in week one. And, you know, we've always seen where Lena Winslow kind of, especially in their state championship years, they stumble, I mean, outside of last year. But prior to that, they stumble in the opening weeks. Yeah. Even in their long playoff run years, they've had some hiccups at the beginning of the year. But by week nine, heading into the playoffs, they have a dynamite machine rolling. Yeah, we tend to open the season at Dakota and got killed in the fast the game, rattle off 13 in a row, I think it was, the yep. championship. Uh, 2013, they lose three regular season games, they win the state championship. And then last year, it was kind of a, it was the Lane Winslow show from start to finish. Right. I mean, they, stu- they, they still faced some adversity, but, but they was, overcame it, and they, they definitely uh, made things happen. Um, with Lewis Town, though, you've got Coach Winkler there. Um, Lewis Town is making um, their 18th appearance. Their last appearance came back in 2011 when they lost in the first round to Brown County 28-7. to But the year prior to that, they had to play Lena Winslow in the semifinals during Lena Winslow's first state championship campaign. Lena Winslow obviously won that game. But Coach Winkler and the staff is very uh, accustomed to what Lena Winslow does as um, they have played them, but they come out of the Prairie Land Black Conference, and we've already seen teams last year that uh, got routed by lesser teams than what Lena Winslow is. And case in point, Abingdon Avon losing to Milledgeville, Cuba North Fulton losing to Stockton. That's the same conference that Lewistown is yeah. coming out of. Yeah, and then, God uh, forbid I say it, but if the upstate is handling them, the Northwest should be. Should be a little bit more yet. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's. I I like Lena Winslow big in this. Yeah, I like Lena Winslow big. I would not be surprised if this is over by halftime, as far as a running clock is concerned. Um, I definitely would be shocked if Lena Winslow does not have a forty point lead plus by the half in this game. All right, so now we're getting ready to take. Place with Milledgeville comes in with a three seed, nine no mark as they get ready to take on Fulton. Comes in with a fourteen seed and a five and four mark. Milledgeville is making their twenty second playoff appearance. Last year they lost in the second round to Lena Winslow, forty nine to sixteen, in a game that uh, Lena Winslow was actually up forty two to nothing at the half. Um, so the running clock was rolling by the time the second half started. Uh, Fulton is making their 20th appearance, and last year they lost in the second round to Forrest in 30-6, a game in which uh, Forrest was up pretty large in that one quick and early as well. Yeah. Uh, Fulton coming out of the Three Rivers Conference, obviously they've played some strong schedules. Um, with the fact that they have uh, 42 playoff points, um, they've gone up against the likes of uh, Orion and Sterling Newland, in which they definitely got rolled in those games. They had a close first week loss to Peru St. B, who's staying at home this year. And then they lost to Monmouth Roseville in a crossover conference game um, by two scores. And Monmouth Roseville is in the 3A playoffs. Yeah, um, you know, you look at their schedule and you can kind of be thrown off. They they lose big to the big dogs, but, you know, barely beating Morrison. But then, in return, really taking it to Rockbridge. So yes, that's what uh, I was just looking at. It kind of makes you wonder what they are. Um, you know, I said offset, this Fulton team kind of really reminds me of Dakota. Um, play close with some teams that maybe you shouldn't, and then blow out a couple teams, but get blown out by the far superior teams. I mean... I mean, it's almost like a carbon copy, except in a, just a little bit more tougher conference. Yes, I I, I definitely agree. Um, you're like you said. I mean, they destroyed Rockridge, and Rockridge is six and three in the two A state playoffs. 
And, I mean, you take a look at where Rockridge is heading. I mean, they have a very good opportunity of um, getting past the first round at least um, as they play Clifton Central in the first round. Um, and then you take a look at their uh, next matchup if they were to win that game, which they have a good opportunity to win that game. And they're going to be taking on um, the winner of Orion and uh, Fieldcrest, which is most likely going to be Orion. Right. So they get another second round team. Yeah, they're going to be a second round 2A team. Um, and they beat them. Fulton beat them. And here they are. They're getting ready to set right. take on Millersville. Yeah, and Millersville, I know. You know, our upstate conference champion um, hasn't exactly had a hard schedule, but, you know, they've taken care of business. They have taken care of business. They've done what they needed to do with the teams that were played in front of them. And, I mean, one of the things I like about this Millersville team is they are tough. They, they, they were tough last year. I mean, said it last year. They were probably the most physical team out of the Upstate Conference that we saw oh, yeah. last year. I feel the same this year. They're very physical. But they've also had some ball games that were very close against Aquin and Orangeville. Teams that are 4-5 and five and 5-4. Five and yeah. I mean, and, and that's no knock on Aquin or Orangeville because Aquin is a team that we can definitely see progressing upward by next year for sure. Orangeville has definitely been a team that we've been watching out for the last three years as they continue to improve and progress in their program. And if you really take a look at Orangeville and Milledgeville, as far as a timeline, Milledgeville is here and Orangeville is here, and they've both been climbing together. Well, that's just it. I mean, it speaks volumes in the upstate. I mean, realistically, Stockton. I'm going to throw Aquin in there because the way they played late. Um, Orangeville, Millsville, you know, I know Millsville went 9 0 and people aren't going to like it, but those four teams are pretty close to each other. Um, so, I mean, you know, you, you go with it. But I, I got to go with my gut here on this one. I like Fulton on the road. Yeah, I do. Um, and this is going to be a good game, but I do like Fulton on the road. Uh, you just take a look at the level of competition that they've had. I mean, I as far as conference sake, I want Millersville. Uh, yeah, I want Millersville to win. So, but uh, I think this is going to be a lot for Millersville. Um, if they pull it off, that's awesome. Right. But uh, I like the Steamers in this game. All right, our last game of the night gives us EPC, who comes in with the three seed after they uh, apparently lost the coin flip. Thank God. Yeah, works, <laughs> works out in uh, the God. Wildcats' favor for sure. Thank you for coming north of the West, even though that did make the most sense. Yes, it did make the most sense, and it was the right thing. Um, because you could see that that was definitely one of those things where, in the past, you know. Here's Carthage, and here's Hamilton, and Carthage goes south, and Hamilton goes north, yeah. or vice versa. Oh, you're almost facing that with... Or the fact that you got four 9-0s in the top bracket and only two in the south bracket. Could have split them up. But, uh, no, they, they definitely uh, did it the right way, yeah. which is good to see, to have a little bit of integrity when they're doing these brackets. Yeah, um, I mean, it's bad enough we're going to get a 1 through 32 anymore. Yeah, right, exactly. So if we're going to do north-south, let's make it a legit north-south. I mean, right. it makes most sense. Um, anyway, you know, EPC 9-0, and they're getting ready to set take on with uh, Chicago Harlan, who comes out of the uh, Illini Windy City Conference of the Chicago Public League. They come in with a 5-4 and four mark. EPC is making their 19th playoff appearance. Last year, they lost in the first round to eventual state champs, uh, GCMS 50-14, to where Harlan is making just their fourth playoff appearance in school history. Their last appearance was in 2010, where they were in the 5A state playoffs, and they lost to Vernon Hills in the first round, 51 to nothing. And if you look at the prior two, uh, or their first two uh, playoff appearances, they came in 08 and 09, so they actually had a string of three straight playoff appearances. In those first two, they were in Class 6A, and now here they are in Class 2A. Now that's a heck of a drop off. Yes, it is. But with that, their enrollment has dropped pl plenty, as well as they sit at a 381 enrollment now, solid, three, or solid 2A school. 
Uh, yeah, so, I mean, 381, definitely solid in two-way. Uh, but you take a look at what uh, Harlan has done, and the Falcons have not played a whole lot of consistent competition. Their biggest game, or I should say team, that they faced off against was Chicago Orr, who's also in the uh, Class 1A playoffs, and they lost that game 40 to nothing uh, back in Week 8. Uh and then, you know, they lost to uh, Chicago Agricultural Science, who's 7-2, and 28-20. to 20, And Ag Science, if you remember, lost 50 to nothing to Orr as well. Yeah. So, it's, you know, it, it, it's always, for us, it's always hard to tell how the Chicago Public Leagues are going to play out because we don't get a lot of experience of coverage with them. It's almost like... They're in their own, I mean, they are their own league, but it's almost like they're doing their own thing and then come playoff time, here have some teams. Right. Because you don't get the coverage, you don't get the scores until the next day or maybe the Monday. And then when you have issues and you got games being made up like Monday morning a few weeks ago because of incidents in the city, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to keep everything straight. And you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, one of the things that we've always seen over the years with the Chicago teams is a lack of discipline. Yep. You see a lot of talent, a ton of talent, but you don't see the discipline, and then they get smacked in the mouth, and when they get smacked in the mouth, they kind of quit. Yep. Um, but, you know, we have, we've seen some very good ones. I mean, Hales Franciscan just a few years ago when they still had a school, they were very tough. Yeah. And, I mean, that one team that they lost to Forreston with, um, they had three Division One players on that team. Yeah. And they just, because of the lack of discipline, they couldn't put it all together, and they lost in the second round. Um, and they barely beat an Aquin team that was literally afraid of them that year. But, um, anyhow, um, Harlan, 5-4, and four, but EPC... As long as EPC comes ready to play the way they did last night, the way they've done earlier this year with uh, Forreston and Lena Winslow, uh, they should be able to roll hard on pretty quick. Yeah, EPC big. Yeah. All right, Shane, it's that time that we start to pick our predictions as far as who we see making it to Champaign. In five weeks, it's going to be interesting. I think uh, 1A is going to be rather tough, but I think 2A is going to be even tougher. Yeah, um, kind of uh, a little opposite of shooting fish in a barrel. Fill out a bracket and hope for the best. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very I much mean, so. 1A is going to be easier to pick than 2A, I think. Should be. I um, mean, as yes, far as the man. north, the right. south is going to be tough. Yeah, and not in a good way. Right. Yeah, because whoever shows up in the south is going to have a rude awakening come champagne. Yeah. That's just my opinion. So uh, you can like it. You don't have to like it. I really don't care. Yeah, that's it's why just the way it's going to be. That's why we're going to pick some winners here. Yeah. So, uh, you want to go first, or you want me to go first? Uh, you can go first. You can okay. let us on everything else. So sure. The season's gone. Go for it. All right. Class 1A. You know, the way I see Class 1A North, if everything can go to plan the way that it's set up and based off the competition, I like Aurora Christian representing the North in Champaign. Um, I think it will be a very good game with Lena Winslow in the quarterfinals. I do think that that's the matchup that you're going to see determine who the state champion is. Um, no, that's not my bias to the North. It's just how I honestly feel. Um, I just don't see anybody in the South now that Tuscola is gone that is going to compete with either one of those two schools. Very nice. I uh, didn't pick myself one yet. I was going to say. In the South, this is where it gets a little bit yeah. dicier. Um, in the South... I have Camp Point Central picked. I just like the style of play that uh, Coach Brad Dixon has the Panthers playing at. You look at their schedule. They've played a tough schedule, one of the toughest schedules out of all the teams in the South. Um, I, I, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, obviously, uh, Argento Oriana is sitting down there along with Red Hill. 
but I just like where they're heading, um, and I can see them getting the state. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, because like I said, it's a hard one to pick here, but I like where CPC's going. Yeah, I, realistically, I mean, we've talked about them all year, and they've kind of just taken care of business here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my 1A North, um, like you said, it, it's going to come down to the Roar for sure, and wins in my opinion. Um, Forrest and could make a run at it if they play well. Um, I like Lena Winslow again in the North. Um, if they play like they did last night, they can handle AC. It's just going to be whether they will be able to and where that game takes place and all the logistics of it. So I'm going to go with the one seed having in Avon. Um, no, they're uh, right. uh, wrong. That was last year. <laughs> and not the one seed. Um, Argenta, yeah. Because I've, I've stuck with them all year, really. Yeah, you have. Um, definitely like the Bombers from I the did. Um, and a lot of things that I've been mocked for, I'm going to stick with. So I'm going to stick with Liam Winslow over Argenta for the first back-to-back titles in a long, long time. Yes, um, and so my pick, obviously, for the 1A title is going to be Aurora Christian. I just don't see where... Any team from the South is going to match up with them, whoever that is. All right, moving into Class 2A. Um, you know, Shane, this is going to be the toughest one to pick. you got a lot of good teams, North and South. Uh, we've mentioned them over and over and over in our uh, playoff show. Uh, but GCMS, Hope, Illini West, EPC, Newman, Orion. Uh, and then down in the south, you got St. Teresa, Athens, Tuscola, uh, Moreau Forsyth, obviously. It's both north and south in 2A is going to be a big time bracket to really watch and pay attention to. You got 32 teams in 2A and 10 or, 10 or 11, which could win the day in the title. I mean, we haven't seen that in a long time. Right. It's, it's awesome. Right. Um, like I said, I mean, two ways where it's at, that's going to be the bracket to watch this year. Uh, but we'll go with the picks, and for my pick, I mean, one team that's really stuck out to me all year has been uh, Gibson City, Melvin Sibley, as they just continue to roll, and, I mean, they are just looking like the team to dominate once again. Uh, have a very good shot of repeating for their state title. Um, and, I mean, they honestly, they look even stronger than they did the, last year. I mean, they've only given up 24 points on the year. They've scored 442 points on the year. So, I mean, just do the averages. And, I mean, it's just crazy how scary good they are. I, I mean, the most yeah. points they gave up was 12 to Eureka, who's in the 3A playoffs. Yeah, I don't want to speak out of turn here and say something I don't know, but 20, I mean, that's got to be getting close to a record of some sort. <sighs> it's got to be I mean, it's got to be close. Um, you know, the 75 St. Teresa team that pretty much shut out everybody they played was pretty yeah, legit. Yes. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, I mean 24 points. And it's not like they play in a weak conference, obviously, because, I mean, you look at the heart of Illinois Conference, and they've pumped out the 2A state champion each of the last three years. Yeah. And they've been in, they're in the title game two years prior to that as well, in 2013. So, I mean, good competition there, no doubt about it. Uh, but I like a rematch. GCMS and Moreau Forsyth, and I got GCMS picked to win again. Wow. Um, would love to see that, though. All right, uh, my 2A, yeah, I mean, GCMS, no secret in the North. Um, that's what I'm going to go with. Uh, but they're going to face a little more challenges than what they've had to this point. I mean, their closest game was a 28-point win. Um, at some point in these playoffs, they will be tested. And uh, we'll see what happens. And South, I'm going to stick with St. Teresa. Ryan on the back, so Jakarta, yeah, my God. Kids a stud. Um, I mean, that was evident two years ago. One, well, now three years ago, I guess, right? No, it was still two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. It was a sophomore year, yeah. yeah. Um, watching them down against Force. And so, uh, St. Teresa against GCMS. I'm going to pick GCMS. Also, for back to back titles, which would, in my prediction, pick the 1 and 2 8 to both go back to back. And I don't think that has ever happened. 
Uh, no, it's not. And um, that, those, those are some pretty bold picks for sure. Um, but I like it. I like it a lot. Um, but like I said, it's going to be a lot of fun, um, both 1A and 2A. All right, Shane, so that wraps up what we have as far as our playoffs uh, matchups and where we see the predictions taking place. Um, should be a lot of fun, like we've already stated. I mean, 2A is just a boatload to watch. 1A is going to be uh, tough to pick as far as 1A South, but uh, 1A North pretty much got two teams, and that's about it. Yeah, um, we'll see what happens here. Uh, Nonetheless, it's always great this time of year, especially this first couple of weeks where you get more games and you got a better chance for upsets. Um, you know, it, it's just fun. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be fun. I mean, obviously anything can happen. Let's not let's not forget that. Yeah. I mean, we could see some bigger upsets happen. Mm -hmm. um, and you never know. I mean, maybe some teams that we're not so sold on prove us different. And, I mean, that's always possible, too. Um, but... It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. And we get to go back to Champagne this year, which is yeah. even more fun. Yeah. But uh, we'll get the times posted for all the games as we get those in here. We've got four games out there already. And of those, we have Polo at Princeville on Friday night at 7 p.m. Dakota at Stockton at 1 p.m. on Saturday. Orangeville at Marquette is at 1 p.m. on Saturday. And Fulton at Milledgeville is also at 1 p.m. on Saturday. So we're still waiting for the EPC game, the Lena Winslow game, the Forreston game to get scheduled. Um, so we just have those three games left. Um, we'll also be rolling out our bracket challenge. We'll get the brackets up on the uh, Facebook and Twitter pages, um, the good old tweeter machine. Um, but we'll get those brackets up there, and we'll get the bracket challenge going in place. If you're into it, don't submit a bracket. It's old. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm claiming my three P. There you go. Shane wants that three P title in the two A bracket. Also, right now, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Hayden Keltner. He was our NUIC Peckham champion for the uh, regular season. So good job, uh, Hayden. I'll get a hold of you as far as how to get your winning t-shirt to you. So congratulations on that. Um, but be a lot of fun here. You yeah. got something to say? Um, no, I was just thinking about some things. So should be a good weekend. Trying to plan how you're going to win 2A again, right? Yeah. No, I'm not. Uh, I was just thinking of some other things. So. Oh, okay. Well, get out to the games this weekend. It's the playoffs. It's a best five weeks of the football season as we start the road to Champaign. As always, root for the NUIC.